actually have already had several orders today. I was I was shocked at how many came in on the first day. So I'm very happy about this. It means that this is the future of what people want to see on on their layouts. I'm convinced of it. I think you're on the right track, as they say. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And, and uh, I love your new video. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Uh, Pat, I understand we are not streaming on YouTube. Did, yeah, did we are hear? now. Okay, we are now. Thank you. Uh, I've got a couple more announcements, and we'll get to the show. The Pacific Coast region uh, is having their convention. It starts on the 24th of this month and runs through the 27th. Uh, the virtual convention part of it, which we are involved in, is New Tracks Modeling, uh, starts on the 25th to the 27th. Uh, if you want to participate in the virtual part of their convention, it'll cost you for the three days, it'll cost you $20. Uh, if, you, if you sign up and use the code PCR24, if you use that code, then your total cost for the, uh, for the convention virtually is, uh, is $20. Uh, we are having a breakout room during that convention for new tracks modeling and our scholarship program on the 26th at 5.30 to 6.30 Eastern time. So if you, if you do sign up for the virtual convention, I hope you'll stop by our breakout room between 5.30 and 6.30 on uh, April 26th uh, and uh, say hello and so forth and uh, uh, talk to us a little bit. The other one I want to mention is Scott Gears Convention, the uh, great uh, uh, scale model train show in Timonium uh, starts on Saturday the 27th at 9 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and on the 28th from 10 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and he'll he's put on he's he's got a, a really great show schedule. I got a list of all of the uh, the vendors that have signed up for it and their table locations and everything today. We uh, our table uh, is in the uh, the entry hall uh, as you walk in. So uh, I think that we'll have a lot of people see uh, see our table and see our banner. And I can't thank Scott enough for uh, for donating the space to us and, and the table and so forth, uh, so that the new track modeling can be represented at his show. The last show I want to mention is the one coming up, Oscale West in Santa Clara, California. And that show is May the 24th uh, through the 26th. Now, if you want to find out more information about these uh, two shows, the Great Scale Model Train Show.com, GSMTS.com. That's the website, and you can get all the information you need for the uh, Timonium show there. And for Oscale West, it's oscalewest.com. And you can get all of the information, the hotel registration and so forth uh, at, their, uh, at their site. So that's what I've, I've got for announcements uh, for this evening. So to start the show, I want to introduce uh, Janie Bothwell as the host for S-Scale Modeling. And the sponsor for this segment is the National Association of s -Scale. So, Pat, if we could play the sponsor's video first and then uh, turn it over to Jamie. Are you looking for something a little different in your model railroading? The National Association of s -Gagers suggests you take a look at S-Scale. An S-scale model is just 36% longer than an HO model, but it's two and a half times the volume. The larger size translates to increased ease of maintenance, more durable details, and improved electrical and mechanical reliability. S-scale modelers use accurately proportioned wheels and track systems with KD-style couplers. Exceptional S-scale models and layouts are being built in both standard and narrow gauge. Locomotives and rolling stock are available from a number of manufacturers in both ready-to-run and kit form. Equipment is available both new and through an active secondary market. There are numerous manufacturers of track, 
buildings, vehicles, and details, both ready to run and in kit form, available for those who love to build. And many S modelers enjoy kit bashing and scratch building in the larger size S offers. To learn more, visit the website of the National Association of S Gagers. Here you will find the history of the scale, information about clubs in your area, see layouts and connect with current manufacturers and online groups, plus much more. In short, the website has everything you'll need to explore model railroading in S-Scale today. Come on board and visit soon. Well, let me turn this over now to uh, Jamie Bockwell, who is the host for this segment on S-Scale Modeling. Jamie, welcome. Hi, how you doing? Boy, I uh, I hadn't Good. seen the video. I hadn't seen the video before. She kind of cut into some of my presentation. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, I started thinking about you know why would anybody model in S scale? Why why would anybody model in any scale? Really, what any scale has is its size. Aside from HO, which of course being a very popular scale has a product. Okay, but you know, pretty much everything else, it's it, you know, is it the right size? Um, you know, I tend to look at this. I, I know there are people out there who will take issue with this, but to me, if you're going to run your trains, if you're going to operate and scale teams, it seems to be favors things, what, what I would call train operations. So like, you know, this train pulls into a siding, another train comes along, uh, you know, passes it and then the train can leave the siding. So you're not, you know, I mean, I know there are people that switch cars in S in, in scale, but uh, you know, it, the smaller scale, I'm sure that's a little more problematic. You know, you get to H O and S, they kind of hit that sweet spot of kind of the, both of them. You can kind of cover both. And if you get up into like O scale or even G scale, you start getting this idea that, you know, you're close up right to the railroad, you're shifting the cars around, uh, you know, and of course there are clubs obviously that have more space, but you know, if you're trying to buy a very large O scale uh, operation, you're going to need a lot of space. So S scale hits that sweet spot of a little bit bigger, but not as big as O, um, you know, the perfect size we like to call it. Of course, really, you know, that's what every layout, every, every scale has going for it is its size. So but we of S scale like to think that, you know, we get a little bit of that O scale heft, you know, as the video said, you get more reliable um, operation, the, you know, that mass, the, the electrical contact is better, uh, but you don't have to deal with quite the same space uh, gobbling scenery items and whatnot that, that you deal with in O scale. Um, you know, O scale, as they said, we have a number of good manufacturers. I'm going to highlight some of those in a minute, uh, but we also have, um, you know, the, there is a very active secondary market going on right now. So, you know, it's a great time to get into S. It's the, there's a lot of stuff that's available. So anyway, let me just see if I can share my screen here. All right, let's see if I pick do, 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 this one. All right, so let's see if I do that share. I think we're good. All right, so what have I got? Uh, design. Nope, sorry, that's my school. <laughs> Don't want to share that. What the heck? How'd I close that up? All right, I guess I'm going to have to stop the share and try to start the share up again. Maybe it's this one. Okay, so there we are. So let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, okay, so the first thing I wanted to mention is that there is an S scale uh, group on Groups IO. Actually, there are several S scale groups on Groups IO. Uh, this seems to be the the more popular one. Uh, again, this is the scale modeling side. S scale has, of course, a high rail side. Uh, they have their own uh, groups IO list. But you know, in terms of the fine scale, one sixty fourth modeling. And when I say fine scale, I mean you know not high rail, not necessarily the Proto sixty four. Although there is a Proto sixty four uh, group available also. Anyway, so you can see we have eight hundred and eighteen uh, eight hundred and eighteen members. Um, you know, fairly active. There's ten or twelve posts every day. Um, and, you know, if you were ever looking for something in S-Scale, you can post on this list. Hey, anybody got this or anybody know how to do that? And there's always people that are willing to help you out. OK, so, you know, if you're curious, if you're S-curious, join up the Groups I.O. list uh, and, you know, read a bit, see what comes your way. If you want to ask questions, people will provide answers. OK, the NESG, of course, you saw that photo in the video. That's from Bob Weary, our S-Scale photographer friend. 
Um, and then what, oh, they, they're fading on me. I wanted to get the first one again. Okay. So if I go back to the first one, where'd he go? Yeah, there it goes. A new stock car up there that was just put up recently. Uh, our webmaster is a great guy. He does all kinds of work. He's always working really hard, putting new material up there. Um, and so they put up a new picture, I don't know, about once a week, I guess. So you click to get into the site and then you can go down and see all the last photos from the last, you know, so, so much period of time. Um, there's that photo again. Uh, and if you go along and there's a little SCL video at the bottom. Okay. So now the, they mentioned the website, all kinds of good stuff. I use the product gallery a lot because uh, there's a lot of research that you can do uh, looking into, um, you know, like what product am I looking for? Did anybody ever make this? Um, so there's a, again, this is being updated, but you know, you can see all, all this stuff is categorized. Uh, so you can quickly find it. All right. And if you look under the resources, I think it is, you can find histories of some of these companies uh, that, you know, maybe went out of business a long, long time ago. So you can figure out what's going on. So anyway, I, I won't bore you with that because you can certainly go through and look at that yourself. A couple of our big manufacturers, American Models, uh, you know, you can see they make, there's a nice cheap nine. If you come down here, here's all the different locomotives that they're producing. Uh, so there's, you know, quite a bit available in S scale. Um, you know, here's, that's their rolling stock in addition to the locomotives, those, you know, features there, but they make, uh, passenger cars and a whole, whole line of stuff. Right. So you can see the RS 11s. All right. Anyway, so American models, uh, they, they make a lot of S scale trains. Um, and so then, uh, scale trains also has the scale trains bought out Mike's train house S scale line, which was s helpers s scale line and they renamed it s helper again uh so it's they have now issued uh this box car which is a 40 foot rebuilt box car you can see uh they've also issued a series of hoppers i think i'm on page two here or something oh i'm i'm on the retired page sorry um these are the ones you can't get anymore uh let's see where's it going? freight cars i don't know if i click that okay so anyway there's no, no, no. I don't, I don't want retired. Let's get rid of retired. Okay, there we go. So there's a bunch of the two bay hoppers that they make that you can get. Um, and they also have the box cars that you can get. Uh, let's see, in stock six. And anyway, if you want to look at it, I'm I'm lost here. All right, freight cars. Let's go there. Da, 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 da. Okay, so there's a caboose. Uh, the cabooses are on the way. They're not here yet. Um, but uh, again, all of these basic body styles maybe not different um road names but all these basic body styles have been available so they're certainly available on the used market too so if you really want a wide vision caboose you can go out and find one they're out there okay um so let's see american miles uh, and the other one is uh does planes hobbies under their s scale america line uh offers a lot of things now i put this one up because they they have some modern box cars i think uh, american models makes an an uh uh a rail box car also. I, I'm I'm not all that familiar with the uh the the modern stuff because I tend to aim toward the 1950s myself, although I lately been venturing into like the early teens, mid-teens, <laughs> building some wood cars. So anyway, but this is uh they have a couple of different uh, modern box cars. Uh there's also a uh a stack car that's been available. Again, I don't know the availability of it right now. Um, American Miles also has a, a spine car. Again, I'm not sure what's available at this time. So, but there's plenty available as far as you know. Like I say, if you go on to the S scale, uh, the I the groups I O list and post, you know, hey, I'm looking for this. Usually, somebody will, uh, you know, there's very often somebody will have one that they're willing to sell, or uh, they can certainly point you in the right direction. So let's see. I'll stop the share here. All right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I've been tempted a couple of times. I, I started out my personal journey. Um, well, I mean, I started out with a Marx train when I was like, you know, two or three years old. And um, I, I ventured into HO at about age 10 and I was there until, I don't know, my mid twenties. Uh, and I discovered S scale and, you know, I'd always, I'd always known S scale existed. As a matter of fact, American model started out in, in my hometown. Uh, Farmington Hills, Michigan. So I'd always kind of, you know, the, the local hobby shops carried some of the stuff. So I always knew it existed and I always was curious about it. And when I really saw it in person, I really liked it. And I, I, I'll tell you a couple of times I've been tempted to go back to HO, but then I get out some of my 
S-scale Pullman cars. Here you go. So those of you who know me know I'm a kind of a passenger guy. I, I, I look at these S-scale beauties and I'm like, oh, man, these are so awesome. Because, you know, again, you can see all that detail under there. It's just, you know, and now this this was an American Models car that I uh, painted and decaled. Actually, I, I, I guess I just decaled it. It came in the green paint. But I, I added all that underbody detail under there. And that's all. Those are all parts that are available. Um, you know, a couple of them, these battery boxes here, these big square things are the actual American models parts still on the car. Uh, some of those are brass details from Bill's train shop, uh, and some of bts.com. And some of them are, um, resin parts from a company called Precise, who's out in Colorado. I believe they're Precise.com. So if you wanted to check them out. So that's the, every time I think, oh yeah, maybe I could fit more in an HO. Maybe I could do it. And I, I look at these and I think, nope, can't go anywhere. These things are just too cool. So, and again, just to show you, you know, we, we do have brass models in S scale. All right. There's a lovely 13 double bedroom car, um, South wind brass. Look at all that detail under there. Beautiful. So, so just to show you a little bit about what, you know, S scalers are doing today, what we're building. And, you know, we are, uh, we are, we, I'm, we are thriving scale. You know, those of us who have found the, found our way there, we have, we're, we're, we're sort of a close knit family. So, um, I was at a train show that I'm going to show you in the May presentation a couple of weeks ago. And somebody, you know, we're for fairly far from flung group. And somebody said, how did you guys find each other? I said, oh, you know, S scale is kind of a small world. We all know everybody. So, um, and that's, that's also one of the interesting things in S scale is that you, uh, it, you know, if you're in S scale, I always say the first purchase you make is from a company, but from then on you buy from a person, you know? So like you call, uh, you know, does planes on, I don't, I'm saying this now. And of course, a lot of these people are not in the business anymore for various reasons, but you know, like you, you, you call American models on the phone once and you talk to American models, but the next time you call, you, you're talking to the owner and you, you just greet them by name, you know? So, uh, you know, it's, it's that kind of small world feeling, you know, it's, if you, yeah. you can also have a, you can have a, uh, your input is valuable. You know, you, the, the manufacturers are there listening to what it is you want to buy. So, you know, you tell them and, you know, you, you have direct contact with the manufacturers rather than, you know, some of the larger, more populous scales where you just sort of sit around and wait for them to produce whatever it is that they want to produce. And hopefully it's what you want to buy. So anyway. Well, I, uh, Thank you so much, Jamie. We really oh, do appreciate you. I hate to stop you, but i got to move on tonight and look forward to seeing you back in May and see some of the video that you've got, you took for this, from the show and hear some more about S scale from you. Okay. Well, I was, that's good that I was, I'm, I'm getting cut off cause I was about done anyway. So that's all <laughs> that works. Um, yeah. I, I didn't really shoot video. I just, it's just still fixed, still pictures. So, um, but I'll, I will show those and, and we'll see those next time. So, all right. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Jamie. I really appreciate it. Okay. Good night. Well, now I want to introduce uh, Jack uh, uh, Yodel uh, for the build along of one of his Ipswich Hobbies uh, section houses. Jack, welcome. Thank you very much, Jim. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, pull up my share screen here. And Uh, no. If I can figure out how to get to my desktop. Are you trying to get your PowerPoint? Uh... Yes, I'm trying to get to my desktop where I saved it. Let me see here. And I did this perfectly last week. And... Click on share screen, start over. That, that'll help. Yeah, okay. There's... Get out of there. Share screen. Uh, 
Oh, I've done it. And I usually Jack, say, Jack, let me do this. Let me let me pass you by while you try to figure this out with Pat, and I'll come back to you after uh, Tom Farrell. How's that? that? That's fine. Okay. Well, well, let me introduce Tom Farrell to talk about his Turtle Creek uh, scratch building project on his model railroad. Tom, welcome. Thank you again for having me. It's always a pleasure to be on. <laughs> Um, this evening, I have um, everybody hear me okay, by the way? Yes. 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 If I'm not in true voice, I'm just ending about my fourth bout with COVID. <clears throat> I, we should be engaged. I've had it so many times. Okay, so this is part five of my Turtle Creek tunnel and mining scene. Uh, this evening, uh, I first want to start with... Uh, was pointed out that uh, I had a little misspelling on the Ananga mine uh, last week, but I have fixed this. And as soon as I get the approval here from Ron, <laughs> Father Ron, I'll put the <laughs> layout. <laughs> anyway, little little levity there. <clears throat> I'll give you his blessing. <laughs> Uh, Alan Rogers was kind enough he's, to uh, send me a kit uh, of a, um, he calls it Ned's Place, and uh, I did a kit bash of this, and uh, Alan runs New Creations Victorian Railroad Buildings, LLC. Um, I urge you to check out his website and look at some of his buildings. Um, this is what he sent me there on the left. And uh, it's an O-scale shanty is what I've turned it into. Um, when you un It's a laser cut kit. And when you uh, take everything out of the package, that's what you see on the right there. Um, I think one of the most interesting things was the roof material. Um, I like to have unique roofs. And this structure is unique onto itself. Not only is that roofing material unique, but it's a round roof. So uh, that's a first for my uh, shanties on the railroad. So the first thing I did is I left everything into, I didn't cut anything out. I uh, hit it with a weathering mix, this underline blue gray I chose. Um, it's best to leave it in place here to minimize the warpage. Although this is pretty, pretty thick material, so I suspect you wouldn't necessarily get any warpage, but nevertheless, I stained it in place. And then I began assembling it. I used, uh, I could have used yellow glue, but um, I put it together quickly with super glue. Um, when I was cutting this door out, I did manage to break this, but it just adds to the, uh, to the model. It is, um, it is rather robust material. So I, uh, I'll show you, I, uh, first thing I did is I, after I had it all together, is I painted it black on the inside, which is my trademark. I don't like to detail the uh, insides of my buildings. So I painted it with a flat acrylic black. It wasn't really necessary, but I put in these corner braces to uh, further strengthen the model. It's just a bad habit of mine, or a habit of mine. And then I, uh, started with the roofing material. I cut it with uh, just regular scissors. It unrolls um, and I just cut a single large piece, super glued it to the uh, roof. I'll show you how I go on from there. The other addition I made in my kit bash is it doesn't really come with windows. So I, I put a window in here. Um, and then I put some layering of this uh, sheet metal. I just super glued it, uh, cut random pieces in place, super glued it onto the top here. I super glued a piece right on the side, put these um, wooden pieces to hold it in place. Here's some of that trim. Remember I mentioned how this is a very robust laser cut kit. I don't know the thickness, but I'm guessing 040 or something like that. So I wanted, I trimmed it out. So I didn't want those exposed edges. Um, and uh, 
This will look kind of crude till we get to the very end because when you're making a shanty, you know, it doesn't have to be, in fact, the less perfect it is, the better. And the weathering covers up a lot of the, uh, you know, like the sins here, if you will. So that's a, uh, that's the roof detail. This is the front. Um, you know, I added, this is not per the kit. I just added a piece of scrap here, some scrap wood. I added this decking. This is not part of the kit. Um, these are just one by six, one by fours. These are uh, two by sixes, scale lumber. And just with my exacto knife, I just cut into this to weather it a little bit. I put a couple of random boards in here. This is another deviation. I'm making this a shanty on the side of a mountain. So I built this platform and um, this photograph's a little askew. It is parallel and perpendicular. It's just a bad photograph. These are two by tens. This is a pretty robust piece of material. It's an eight by eight material. Then I buried these into the uh, scenery. And then a couple pieces of um, piece of plywood here and a piece of basswood here. And then I test fit my structure onto the side of the mountain. And uh, it's not painted yet, really, just some base colors here. Let's see, this is done on design. It is going to be a shanty on the side of a mountain. So I started with my paint. I just took some, uh, actually, I uh, sprayed it with my uh, unobtainium rust paint. I painted the sheet metal before I cut it. So I sprayed it with that enamel uh, rust that I have, and then I just splashed it with a uh, acrylic um, uh, old silver, actually. And I splash the side of this with a little uh, rust colors and just just really sloppy sloppy painting here. I'm just trying to get a weathered look. I added these boards here to show that uh, you know I want to make it look like a shanty. Now the model's starting to come alive because the weathering's starting to work. My half in focus photograph here. I mean, this, that's, that's a nice look right there. See, it looks like chipped paint. That's what we're trying to get here. Same with up in here. Yeah, I fixed that. All this is a layering process, but it, you know, this is magnified about four times, five times its actual size. If it holds up at this magnification, it looks magnificent at, at scale. There now it's really coming along there. It's like the look of the structure. It's truly unique. I have about eight shanties on the layout, and this one truly stands out with its round roof. And this tin plate is something I've never seen before. There, I've glued it in place. It's on the edge of the layout, so I can't help it. There's no background on this part here. There you go. Now, there's the finished model on the mountainside. I mean, it looks shack like, <laughs> it's all weathered and balanced. There's looking up, you can see the detail, the joists and the flooring. Some of this stuff. Hope Alan likes it. I want to get some comments at the end of this, whether he, there's a nice close up of the model, shows the roof detail, the addition I made of this railing all the way around so the guy, poor guy doesn't fall off the mountainside. So all in all, it's a very nice, unique uh, laser cut kit. It's relatively inexpensive. Uh, 
and it makes a nice addition to uh, feature on the outskirts of my shanty town. So next, I'm going to show you uh, a scratch building of a brick road across the main line in returning to the Turtle Creek scene. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you an overview, but this is my Turtle Creek Depot up here on the right. This is the water tower on the left. I came to the realization there was no good way to get to this depot uh, from the back side of the of the depot. So I thought, let a little imagineering kick in, and we'll just bring a road from the um, from the front of the layout, the fascia, across the main line into the uh, depot area in between this water tank and the depot. <clears throat> I use the uh, Larkspur, the Monster Works um, used brick. It's a very thin material. And um, that, so the first thing I did is I, I cut these runners into the side. I, I took out the ballast and then I cut these runners and then I super glued these runners in between the rails, in between the main line here. It's a dual track main line. That would give me something to support the uh, Larkspur Monster Works brickwork. I did wind up putting a piece of reinforcement plywood on the reverse of this because this is a very flimsy material, especially when it's laser cut. I didn't want anybody poking their finger through this down the road. So I did back these with plywood. And I tried to get it as flush below the rail, but flush to this rail point. So I, I hand filed it in place. So I got a very tight fit and I super glued everything down. And then the next piece was the same. I um, got a reasonably nice fit here. And I put a piece of plywood behind this, just super glued on there. You have to use super glue because a, a water-based, uh, even a yellow glue, this would warp. You have to put weights on it. A lesson I learned earlier. Next up was this portion. Now, if you just glued the um, brick, material onto the ties, it wouldn't be high enough. It'd be quite a bump for a scale vehicle to go across. So I put this little 040 spacer, it's just a piece of basswood in between my Pico ON30 uh, track, code 100 track. So it just fits basically between these uh, uh, rail heads. And then I glued the uh, Larkspur material down there. And then I test drove or test, I took a box car and I just rolled it back and forth and there was no clearance issues. Then I super glued it down in place. <clears throat> I did remove all the uh, ballast from this prior to uh, gluing down my spacer. I found that if you don't remove the ballast and you're not and your ballast is above these ties, you'll get an uneven, you, you won't get a good fit, and the, the, ply, the little basswood spacer won't adhere to these plastic ties. These plastic ties are hard enough to get anything to stick to them. So I want as much surface area as I can. So I, I removed all the ballast, it came right out, and then I scratched this, because I usually when I ballast, I get all kinds of glue and things on there. So I wanted to get down to the plastic. So I scrape this, these ties clean. Then I <clears throat> started the staining process. This is a uh, acrylic rust wash, which I find makes a great brick. So I flooded this with a Vallejo rust acrylic wash as a basically a base coat. And I began adding black cinders to the side here to build up this uh, 
build up the sides. And I did consider putting in a concrete footer here, but I just didn't. I just made it cinder, uh, cinder siding. So. <clears throat> then I used some of this Robert's brick mortar formula, which uh, shake well because it all settles to the bottom here. Uh, this is this stuff's still available. And as you'll see, it's looking very white here, but it, 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 it dries out. This combination of this rust acrylic wash and this Robert's brick mortar is a winning combination. Makes for a very, this isn't even the finished picture, but it makes for a very realistic, uh, you have to put it on there a couple of coats, very realistic brick street. You can see my path is nearly complete here. There you go. So there, I mean, that looks just about as real as you can get. Um, so there's mortar in here. There's This is used brick coming from the uh, Western Pennsylvania, the city of Pittsburgh. We had more than our fair share of brick streets. And this pretty much approximates what that looks like. So this is this includes the weathering here and this doesn't here. So you can see how it just, there's a pullback. Now you see where this is in relationship to the depot and the water tower. The depot's in place, the water tower's just still sitting there on unweathered pads, but that'll that'll come along. And I've built up the cinders here a little bit. There you go. Now we're getting to the, <clears throat> so I've put a, yet another wash on here. And um, my recollection of where I grew up, that's what those streets look like, just like that. I built up the cinders here. That is the finished scene. Uh, as far as the road is concerned. This wave in here was, uh, despite my efforts to plywood back this, it warped anyway, but it, um, I like the warp because these roads are not perfectly flat. They look, they have all these bumps. If anybody's had the pleasure of driving a car in Pittsburgh on one of these brick streets, this is what you get, waves, potholes. Made for a nice touch. Driver there in the car. There's a nice close-up of that uh, water tower, by the way. That has a nice look to it with all these different colors. It's like a like a painting, all these different colors. It's a nice, nice effect there. While we're here, I weather the side of my rails. I paint ties and I paint the rail heads all by hand, the whole layout. It adds a nice little finished touch to the rails or to the track itself. It's Pico. This is the best you're going to do with it. It's not microengineering, but it's much more durable than microengineering. It's virtually so robust. It's virtually uh, damage proof, this Pico Code 100. And when you weather the rails and paint it up like this, it doesn't look too bad. All right. That's all I have for you this evening. Beautiful modeling, Tom. Thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you for joining us. And thank you. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Jack, are, you got your problem solved? I uh, found it while uh, you were. Here we go. How's that? That says uh, April 17th, part two. So we're on. You can hear me okay? Yeah. 
Uh, need to share. Out. You need to share. Ah, uh, okay. Share, share, share. It should be at the bottom, a green button. Share screen. Hmm. Right next to the chat. I, I tell you what, Jack. I tell you what, Jack. Why don't you and Phil and, and Pat work this out? I'm, let me go to Martin because the show is really getting long here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me uh, introduce Martin Bradfield, MMR, uh, for his Scratch Build Corner. Martin, welcome. Hey, Jim. Let's see what I can do. Uh. Now, where's the share screen? No. <laughs> okay. Go You're away, bad. Martin, go away. I'm a mean old man. Uh. <laughs> Just ask, my, ask any of my children. <clears throat> Oh, hell, ask just about anybody. I'm a mean old man. Okay, so we're going to do a, one more quick resurrection project. The third one for the month since I'm off next month, next week, right, Jim? So I hope so, because I only yeah, made sure. these slides. I just, I just made these slides an hour ago. So, you know, short notice, I yes. can throw something together if I have yes, to. Yes, you are, sir. Okay, so here's where we're starting. That's pretty uninspiring. Um, <clears throat> Uncle Wood nailed together. You can see the nails. Uh, this is what old O scale sometimes looks like underneath of everything else. Uh, the underbody, what underbody? It's uh, blank wood. The roof, well, hey, it's got pencil lines on it, yay. And it's got the right shape, but, you know, uh, missing everything. Okay, there's the end. The other ends look, the other end doesn't look any better, so take my word for it. Uh, it's uh, kind of raw. So basically, you know, we got a blank slate and that equals opportunity. You can turn this into anything you want. I'm gonna turn it into a reefer. So, you know, I got a wooden box with a railroad roof. Pretty simple, but totally free to do whatever you want with it. So, you know, this is, this is one of the great things about scratch building. Uh, it'll apply to this. You can do anything you want or can envision moving forward. So we'll build up some doors. Okay, I'm gonna go show one side. I mean, you, don't, you don't need to see the other side. It looks like this side. Uh, 132nd scribe siding cut on a diagonal, framed out with some strip wood, top, bottom, left, right, make two doors, kick plate at the bottom, scribe siding at the top, two frame pieces on each side for the hinges to rest on. The only thing you have to remember when you do this is get out your door latch hardware and your hinges to make sure you make the doors the right height so the hardware matches and you have the width right so you can put the hinges on those hinge plates well that it's just a matter of sitting down and gluing it all up find the middle of the uh blank slate and start putting things together just glue it right down right on top of the of the uh blank side of the uh box for lack of a better word which is now going to become a reefer a refrigerator car well, you get the, get the doors done, it's easy then. You just slap on and skin up both sides with uh, 132nd thick scribe siding. I'm using siding from the, uh, it's probably Kapler, but it could well be Northeastern scale lumber. I don't know of any other sources of 132nd thick scribe siding. Everybody else sell, sell, just sells uh, 16th inch. And this is one of the nice things about 132nd is this box underneath there was probably set for paper or cardboard cardstock sides now we're talking 50 70 years ago so they didn't have any room for something thick so 30 seconds about as thick as you can use for a piece of wood that makes sense for this up do the ends so we'll cover up that nasty end grain put in a piece of uh scribe siding 
end sill. And we'll do a roof. Yeah, I'm not, I didn't get too uh, picky about the center seam because you're not going to see it underneath the roof walk anyhow. It's, a, it's Unless you have x-ray eyes, you can see through the roof walk. I don't worry about it too much. When you can, if you really want to get picky about it, it's going to be exposed for some reason. You can take it, take each piece. It's that's fair, and and you can sand a bevel from the ins under under you know the inside out, and bevel up the edges so it matches up and makes a nice tight seam. Perfectly doable, painfully tedious, but it can be done, and it looks great when you do it. But if it's not going to be seen in this case. I'm not doing it. Okay, so there's the underbody, a better shot of it. I didn't take a very good photo of the underbody, sorry. You've seen the K-brake system before. Uh, you've got a nice brass casting, some uh, brake hangers and brake levers, some wire, train line, cross members, center sill. I think this was my next to last piece. No, I, uh, sorry, I made that center sill. So that's all strip wood and some resin uh, cast uh, car bolsters. The you know, tricky part again, well, there's no tricky part of this one because the train line actually rests above the cross members of this car. Just the way I made it. And some grab irons. I'm not sure who those are. Actually, they're Northeastern. I have a small Ziploc bag left over of Northeastern O scale grab irons. Uh, they're about 15,000 steel wire. When they run out, I, um, well, that bag will go in the trash. Okay, so splash some paint on. And I do, and I do mean use the word splash. There's about four coats yellow on this because even old Floquil yellow, and we all love the smell of Floquil in the morning because it smells like model trains. Um, still doesn't cover very well. Uh, the hardware is All Nation or Walther's. I think it's actually Walther's in this case. Could be all nation. I don't remember exactly. I uh, probably came out of an un unmarked bag anyhow. So you'll know, pre-paint that, drop them on with a little bit of goo, uh, tack board, so top uh, board there, black paint on the bottom. Top side is painted a uh, some red brown, probably southern freight car red, or for, sorry, southern southern freight car brown, which is actually red. Okay, so start playing with some decals. Um, these are old Walther's decals. Probably uh, roughly the same vintage as me, plus or minus a decade. Uh, they still behave fairly well. And I like to stop and take a photo after I get one side done because despite instructions and the pictures on that, I'm going to move stuff around or stuff will move around on the car a little bit. And to get the other side look like this side, that's called, that's what your camera's for. You take a picture of it, print it out. You'll have a reference for what the other side looks looks like when you have it flipped over. It's easy enough to do. Camera, camera is a, a great tool. So, you know, you've got the ladders on now. you got the stirrup steps. All the other stuff is on. All the brake stuff on the end is on. It's boring, but it's there. Okay, so after you get the decals on, go back and do the roof. And I pre-painted, these are white metal hatches, and they're pre-painted and glued in place along with the roof walk, which was pre-painted wood, strip, strip wood. Glue that all down in place, take it outside on a day over 70 degrees, and get the can of clear mat out and couple of coats of clear mat on both sides, all around, top, bottom, left, right, everywhere. And this car is done. It's just that simple. There's the other side. They, they, they come close to matching. Um, as close as my photography tells me to make the match. And there's the roof. A better shot of the roof and the hatches. And that car is done. And this project's done. So out of a, basically a... Uh, a hollow two by four with a beveled roof. You have a reefer car. Takes some, took me about, I don't know, two, three weeks working, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. But wait for the glue to dry, come back and do some more. And that's all we're going to stop. 
until next month. And next month, I'm going to do something really, 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 really unusual for me. I'm actually going to build a car that actually has a real prototype. Don't, don't, don't anybody fall out of your chair or anything here now. Okay. So that's, that's foreshadowing for next month. Okay. So if we got any questions or what have you. Great job. A great, great looking car. Really is. Yeah. Martin, where did you come up with that original two by four? And what uh, made you think you could make something out of it? Well, I probably paid all of five bucks for it. It probably was under under a table out at the Indianapolis car at Indianapolis O scale meet five, eight years ago. I probably and and, and knowing what's in the cardboard box about six feet, I don't know, five feet from me. I know there's six more of them in there um, that are similar in a similar condition. Uh, I think most, most of those are Westbrook cars, but so they have a, they have a center sill, but that's it. And the Westbrook cars had a uh, paper cardstock side. So, you know, they're blank slates. They can, they can be reefers, box cars, whatever. Okay, they can't be stock cars. I'm not going to cut holes in the sides. Um, but they're pretty much open to whatever. Anything else? It's a beautiful job, Martin. So very Absolutely nice. incredible, Martin. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you. Keeps me, keeps shows, me you what little creative, shows you what a little creativity can come up with. Well, I like making those diagonal doors as well. You, you, they, some of yeah. the prototypes had those. I think they're fun to build. They do take a little bit of effort to cut your one thirty second scribe siding on a forty five degree angle. And get enough, but all doable. Gotcha. All right. Well, we won't see Martin next week. We'll see him in two weeks. Martin, thank you so very much. And Jack, how about you? Are you ready now? Can you see it? No, I can't. Well, I see you. I am. Uh, okay. I'm you have this? My share screen. Hit share screen and then it's pick the PowerPoint. screen. Pick, pick the upper left, which is the screen that you're looking at. Pick the upper left. Yes. Click that and then click share at the bottom right. Oh, well. It makes no sense. I, I had no trouble whatsoever for two previous weeks, and I don't know what I'm doing here now. I'm hitting, I can pull up my PowerPoint. It looks great, but you can't see it. So you got to go into Zoom. You got to have Zoom up so you see all of us. I see all of you. Okay. So now at the bottom of the screen, see the green thing that says share screen. All right. Push the old share screen button, yes. Push the share screen button, and then yeah. select the upper left. Upper left. Upper left. Click the upper left. And you can double click it, or you can click it and click share, which is on the lower right. There you go. There you go. Now, now bring your presentation up. Go ahead and click on your PowerPoint. There you go. Click on that. Bring that up. Now put it in a slideshow mode and you're ready to go. All right. That's slide the very show, bottom. Slideshow mode. From beginning. Okay. All right. I thought I was going to strike out here. I had two strikes against me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I apologize, Jim, for... Uh, Don't worry about it, Jack. Don't worry about it. Acting like a rookie here tonight, like I've never done this before. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, okay, this is part two of our build along series of the Ipswich Section House. This is a prototype that was in, in was once upon a time in Ipswich, Massachusetts. We have uh, uh, ended last week. We had done some of the uh, framing around the doors and and various walls. And, and we're building in three scales, uh, obviously. 
which is uh, something I haven't done before, build three different scales and at the same time. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I did not mention uh, last week, uh, we often distress wood prior to a build. Sometimes we do it during the process. Sometimes we wait until it's you know finished and we um, scrape some um, you know a wire brush, which is what I typically do um, before we do the weathering. But um, one of the things I want to point out here is uh, and I mentioned it briefly last week. I think people too often overdo the lifting of clapboards. And uh, down at the lower left in this scene, you'll see this beat up old section house, which is our prototype. You see one board lifted and maybe one next to it starting to come up, hardly anything. Um, and on the sides that I could see, there were no other boards lifted. But the other thing I want to point out here is very often we use a punch, punch uh, tool, punch wheel to make some nail holes. And you see a little illustration in the top right hand side of the slide. In the prototype photograph that you see, I don't see any nail holes. So um, the only time that I use a punch wheel and, and create some nail holes in, in my walls is if I'm building a kit for an AP evaluation. Um, because and my reality is that if you get something on a layout and you're you know, three or four feet away, you're not gonna see uh, nail holes unless you get really sharp eyes or you drip some maybe rust out of the hole or something to make it uh, pop out a little bit. And, uh, and the, you know, razor, uh, razor saw, uh, the old um, Zurin, I think it is, uh, razor saw used quite a bit to distress some wood. Use that on some of the strip wood. Uh, end scale, the end scale model has no um, glass uh, mullions, there's no windows per se. Everything was just all boarded up. The prototype, uh, when I photographed it uh, over two um, different occasions and, and had some other prototype photographs from others, it was always boarded up. Uh, so in the end scale, everything is so delicate anyway, we simply uh, provided the um, parts that you see in the top left photograph. Um, and on the main completed, almost completed photograph on the top, that small window, I'm guessing that that probably was to add a little light to a loft that might have been inside the window. But you just shave down that uh, that framing and and you can fit that um, that little shutter or piece of plywood just to block out that window. And down below, uh, we call it a shutter because there's a couple of hinges that were on the original. Uh, I didn't think it made any sense to have hinges on that, but that was on the prototype. So that we, that's what we produced here. And uh, in this uh, in scale version, you um, you know we put the uh, framing on the inside, the window casement. Uh, there's no glass. There's no um, acetate um, mullions. We just glue the. Uh, um, the plywood over that window. On the HO version, we um, provide, as you can see in the center top, we do provide the option of having, uh, you know, the opportunity to board up the windows. But what I've done and, and what I um, prefer, frankly, even though it's not um, prototypical uh, in the era that I photographed the, uh, the actual prototype, but we provide the peel and stick um, uh, self-adhesive and you'll see it at the very top, this uh, item here, it's sort of a yellowish color in the photograph. Uh, those are the two part windows. The, the U shape is the framing that goes around each of the windows. And you'll see that there's a, a total of uh, you know four, you have the two I'll call them loft dip windows, the two top windows, and then of course the main windows. Um, everybody calls the um, models windows that we get double hung, but I think technically they're really single hung since you can only move one of the sashes, the lower sash. So the first thing you do is uh, peel off the backing of the windowsill itself, 
uh, that it's self-adhesive, just sticks right on to the uh, um, base of each of the windows on each side. Then, then uh, what I do is peel off the backing of the um, two-part windows themselves, and you cut out the uh, acetate. Uh, it's already laser cut to fit, and those uh, go right onto the uh, uh, back side of the adhesive on the mullions on the windows. And you can model them so that the windows are open or fully closed. The old scale version, you can see here on the left, I've modeled it so it's partly open on the bottom. That photograph on the right shows the various pieces that uh, I was referring to. These are painted now, of course. Uh, these are the window framings on the top. Uh, the uh, one and two pieces for each of the main windows. The top loft windows, there's just uh, one window with, uh, uh, you know, a four square, uh, four piece window. And of course the window uh, sills at the bottom. Those are the pieces that you peel off all adhesive back. And as uh, uh, I give a shout out to uh, uh, Father Ron a while ago when he was reviewing this, I had one error in the instructions. Uh, um, you only put on the HO scale, uh, the framing on the windows, if you were going to board them up. If you're not gonna board them up, you don't need to frame the in windows. You just simply use these adhesive parts and everything fits perfectly on those. And part three, uh, next week, we're gonna be installing the doors and we'll go vertical with a wall assembly. And May 1st, we're going to do the roof and final details and show some of the bills from our customers. So unless you have any questions, we got the windows in and we had done the framing, most of the framing last week. And with that, I will see you next week. We'll go vertical next well, Jack, week. I appreciate it so very much. That's a great little structure. I mean, you know, it's it's small enough where you could put that almost anywhere. Yes, you can. And regardless you of what scale you're in. Yeah, and when you see some of the customer bills, you'll see that they've used them, they've repurposed some of them, and uh, they have all kinds of yeah. different colors. <laughs> so. Uh, a lot of creativity in some of the models that I've, that I've seen so far from customers. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, thank you thank so you. very much for being here this evening. See you next week. Or, thank yeah, you, see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, now I want to introduce Kurt Thompson, uh, MMR, uh, to talk about the achievement program with us a little bit of the NMRA. Kurt, welcome. I do not see him. Okay. Uh, then he must have had a, an accident or some problem that he couldn't be here this evening. So then let me go to uh, uh, Phil Edholm, who has joined us uh, after another uh, uh, meeting that he had to attend uh, to talk about his convention coming up and particularly the virtual part of it. Phil, welcome. Thanks, Jim. Hang on. Let me, I'm trying to get myself all set up here. That's the, uh, it, it always takes a second. So thanks, Jim. I wanted to just real quickly, we're a week away from the Pacific Coast Region Convention, which includes the virtual convention. So I wanted to, uh, Jim and I talked, thought it was a good opportunity to talk to everyone one last time in case there are folks that are, are interested in, in coming. So let me talk about it real quickly, and then we can just have a general conversation. I'm going to be very fast tonight. Um, so we will be doing a convention in, uh, we'll be doing the convention in the Silicon Valley next week, starting Wednesday, the 24th to the 28th. Um, it, uh, if you are interested, uh, probably a late date, if you're, if you're not already registered, um, it's going to be a great opportunity. Um, have 46 layouts open, some amazing layouts, um, at least four or five that probably will not be available in four, in, five, in four years the next time we get together, and $139 room rate. Um, we couldn't match the 
$79 room rate that was in North Carolina for the North Carolina convention in the fall. Um, but 139 for California is really pretty good. But what I really want to talk about is the virtual convention. So what we've done is we're creating what's called a hybrid convention where you have the physical convention and a virtual convention that work together. And what we're doing is taking a number of the elements from the physical convention and putting them into a virtual convention that anyone can attend. Um, and again, very important, anyone can attend this. If you're not an NMRA member, you don't have to be an NMRA member. You can just register and come to the convention. Um, what we're doing is we're taking one of the clinic tracks. Um, it's all up online, but I'll talk about it in a moment. Um, we're gonna have a contest room or tour, a vendor and layout uh, a tour. Um, we'll have the prototype tours. We're gonna have videos of them. So you'll be able to see the prototype tours. Uh, and then what we're doing is we're creating something with birds of a feather sessions and breakouts that really changes this kind of an event from being what we see as normally a Zoom meeting like this, where um, if you've seen today, it's a sequential set of speakers. Um, there are sometimes some questions and answers, but it's not really an open dialogue. Um, what we found when we did the 2021 convention and the same group of folks that did the NMRA National Virtual Convention in 2021 are doing this um, regional virtual convention is if people can interact and talk, and then especially if when they decide there's something they want to talk about, they can go to a breakout room and have a conversation. It really changes the way it feels. It begins to feel like an event, like a convention, not like a Zoom meeting where you're just listening to people talk. So what we're going to be doing at the convention is we will have a Zoom meeting. It'll be just like this. You'll join it. That'll be where the clinics will be presented. So in the morning and the evenings, there will be clinics and breaks and that kind of thing. But when there's not a clinic being presented, that room just becomes a gathering room. It's a place where you can get together. There, we found at the National Convention, there were often 20 or 30 people in that space just talking to each other. Um, and then what we'll do is use the Zoom breakout feature. Um, for all of you, there is this concept of being able to create a breakout room where you jump into that and it's a separate little Zoom meeting for just the people that want to go to it. Um, so we'll do that for things like the clinics goes on. So when a clinician gets done doing his clinic, he'll basically go to a breakout room that'll be the clinic that's the clinic goes on breakout room. So if you decide rather than listening to the next clinician or you pass the 20 minutes or right after the clinic, you can go into that breakout and ask the clinician a question, have an interaction in what's essentially a Zoom meeting. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to have breakouts for associations, and you can see some of them up here. Um, they have the OPSIG, the LDSIG, OSKIL Central, Women in Model Railroading, New Tracks Modeling, and then uh, other just rooms like Dead Rail. We're going to do Wi-Fi and DCC um, and topics that just people suggest. Hey, I'd like to have a room. Let's go do a room. We're going to set it up so there will be spaces you can go to. If three or four people start talking about a topic, they can just literally go get a room and out continue the conversation. Uh, one of the things we've done with New Tracks is we produced a virtual train show. So in the virtual train show, there will be a number of vendors that are participating. And some of them you quite frankly know here from new tracks. Um, what they're going to do is they've all produced about a 10 minute video about their companies. Um, those are all up on the website. If you're interested in going up and seeing them, you can go up and check them out. Um, but then what they're doing is they're participating in a breakout. So if you look at the schedule for the week on the left, you see the clinics every day. On the right, what you see are the breakouts. So for example, on Thursday at 5.30 to 6.30 Eastern time, um, Dennis Brennan and Chris Kors will be in breakout rooms to talk about their kits, talk about their modeling. Great opportunity to talk to vendors. Uh, for those of you who are new tracks, you know these vendors, but we all know that once you get away from kind of the environment here, a lot of these vendors are not well known. So it's a great opportunity for them to meet a lot of modelers outside of our community. Um, if you look at the week, this is essentially for the, the four, three days what it looks like. Um, we start at eight o'clock in the morning, that's California time. Good news is for you in the East Coast, you can sleep in, it's 11 o'clock. Um, there will be clinics in the morning. We'll be playing the vendor videos uh, at what would be lunch on the West Coast time. Um, you'll see we have a couple of the tours of the SPCRR, that's not the South Pacific Coast Railroad, that's the Society for the Preser Preservation of Carter Railroad Resources. It's a group that is finding and restoring the narrow gauge cars built by the Carter brothers that were really the backbone of early narrow gauge railroading in California. 
Um, Niles Canyon Railroad will be on Friday. Um, they're a pretty amazing organization out here. I think they have 22 pieces of motive equipment and about 40 pieces of rolling stock. They operate on the old SP line through Niles Canyon here in California. Um, we'll continue then with the breakouts we talked about in the afternoon and have some walking tours of the vendors. And also we'll have two MMRs that are going to do a walking tour of the contest room. And then in the evening, we'll have potentially more videos and then close with clinics. Um, we're also including the, uh, the, um, the banquet on Saturday night um, will actually be also broadcast. So if you're interested, that'll be Doug, De Doug, De Doug Debs, who is one of the leaders at the Niles Canyon Railway. that will be talking about you know, how they established a railroad, how they got the old SB right of way away from uh, the landowners that wanted to take it back and run one of the more successful tourist railroads in the United States. Uh, what we're really trying to do is take what is, the, the things that you find at a physical convention as much as possible, trying to translate them into a virtual convention from, you know, the clinics, the prototype tours, the contest room, um, layout tours, quite frankly, are on the website. There are a number of videos, um, operating sessions. We're not going to be able to do any operating sessions. I don't think we will have the banquet, but it's just a great opportunity to meet people. One of the things we found when we did this convention in, in 2001 is people from all over the world met people that had similar interests and were able to have interactions with them and discussions. So if you're interested, you can join the virtual convention for $20. So if you use the code PCR24, this is for, for new tracks, we're making this code available. You get a $10 discount on the $30, um, $30 normal price for the virtual convention. For $20, you can join it. The registration will close on 422. Um, unfortunately, there's not going to be any on-site registration for a virtual convention. Don't quite know how to do that. So if you're interested, need to think about it between now and the 22nd. Quite frankly, I think this is an amazing value. You know, I started thinking about it. We were talking last night at the club I belong to. There's an O-Scale club about the cost of building a car. And it turns out 20 bucks is almost the cost of a pair of couplers for an O-scale locomotive, or it's basically one truck. So if you think about it in your modeling, think about all the things you spent $20 for, to spend $20 to get three days of entertainment, learning, knowledge, meeting new people, learning about new uh, companies. It, I think it's a very good value for everyone. So use that code PCR24. And you can get that $10 discount to $20. I hope to see many of you there. I think it'll be an exciting event. And one of the things that I think is really important, if you know people that are in model railroading or not someone who goes to conventions and is interested, this is a great opportunity to kind of try out a convention. Um, you know, I'm going to a regional convention typically as a $500 to $1,000 um, cost. I was just looking at going to Long Beach and, if you stay at the hotel and register the convention and do a couple of tours without travel to get to Long Beach, it's going to be $2,500. So the idea of being able to go see what a convention is all about, have a lot of great interactions for $20 is a great value and a great way to see if that's something you'd be interested in. So anyway, Jim, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, for those of you on, if you shoot a, a shot of the QR code here, you'll go to the convention website. Um, but I think it's a great opportunity. And if you're out there, don't miss it. Go ahead and register and check it out. Thanks, Jim. I agree. Let me ask you one question. Will the uh, virtual registrants also be eligible for door prizes? We will have door prizes. So what's exciting, we've got, we were very fortunate about getting a number of door prizes. A number of those are gift certificates that are PDF files. So what we're going to be doing is taking a number of the gift certificates that were PDF files, and those will be will go in. There will be probably two or three. Um, you know, and give you examples. Trains. Um, we have a hundred dollar and a fifty dollar gift certificate from Trains. Uh, T R A N Z. They're on eBay. They sell a lot of things there. I have a twenty five dollar gift certificate from Model Railroad Control Systems. Um, so there will be gift certificates that you can get every day. Won't be any physical items because, quite frankly, just don't want to fight with shipping them. 
but we were lucky to get a number of gift certificates. So we'll put a number of those as available in the virtual convention. Thank you so much for that. And just as a, an aside for the rest of the people, Phil knows this and, and has kidded me about it in the past. When, when his organization out there held their virtual convention a couple of years ago, Phil had called me up and said, listen, you got to register for this virtual convention and talk about it on the show. I said, okay. So I did, and we talked about it on the show and, and so forth, and the time came for the convention, and I'd forgotten about it, to tell you the truth. And so I guess the third day or something of the convention, I get two calls from people that had watched the show that night. This was a Wednesday night. They're saying, uh, congratulations. And I couldn't figure out what, it, what, what I had done. And so I emailed them back and said, for what? And they said, well, you won the, the top prize at the convention in California, PCR. <laughs> I said, okay. And so I won the $100 big prize from a hobby shop out in California where they had their virtual convention. So that's why when Phil mentioned that he wanted to do a virtual convention for this one, I thought, oh, geez, this is great. This is an opportunity to win some more money. So that's why I asked Phil if, 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 the, uh, if the people signing up for this uh, virtual convention got a uh, door prize. And I'm glad to hear that some, that some of them hopefully will win a door prize. Thanks so well, much. And, again. And, and, and hopefully nobody will register and forget to come. That's, that, that's definitely a senior moment yeah. we want to avoid. So, well, thanks, Jim. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, now let me turn, since uh, Kurt uh, Thompson uh, didn't join us tonight, I'm really sorry. I don't know what happened to him. I'd sent him an email, advance notice and everything, but and I never heard back from him, so I assumed he was going to be here tonight. So I'll, I'll contact him and try to get him rescheduled. Uh, so let me turn now to Steve Sherrill. What do you want to talk about? Steve, welcome. I know you can't see all of me. I'm Kilroy tonight. But anyway, um, what I want to talk about tonight is micro layout ideas or creating scenes on your own railroad. So let me um, here's my micro that I've taken to a couple of shows, and it looks like this. <clears throat> the idea here was to have some operation in a uh, 12 inch by 20 inch layout. And this particular one is on a lazy Susan. It's got several interesting features. It's got a sector plate here. It's got a sector plate here. It's got a stub switch here. And it has the turntable. That's made of a D, made out of a DVD. Okay. So I, I, the object is you have two cars here, and they have to be switched over to this area here, which is the main line. So it's coming from an industry. They'll unload it and go over to the main line. So you have a facing point switch and a trailing point switch. So you have to use the turntable for a runaround. Okay, that's the idea on that one. But let's. Let's say we wanted to change or create a new look on that particular layout. Okay, let's do, and we're only gonna do it with two things. Okay. So now that's all we did was that. And we create an entirely different look. Now, of course, the backdrops, would, these would be removed. Back here, those would be removed. But um, at a train show, I came up with this piece, which is a very nice rock formation. Uh, it's about a foot by, I guess, eight inches, nine inches. And this was a scratch built station that, that a friend of mine, Steve Fisher, built. All right, now. <clears throat> on this railroad, it'd be a little bit hard to use this. This is mainly so that you get an idea of what you can do to, with just a couple of items to create a small railroad. 
Now, normally on a micro layout, there would probably be a circle around this. And so what we have done, we have just created a scene and use that as a basis for a small, portable micro layout. Um, <clears throat> these, this type of layout is becoming more and more popular. And at train shows, you see a lot of them. At uh, Al Judy's O Scale show, we saw 10. As um, in June before that, I think there were seven. So, so they're increasing in popularity <clears throat> because. You can, you can build one structure and build an entire scene around it uh, and plus have movement. Now, since I'm battery powered, I don't have to worry about any, any wiring on any tracks. And that makes a big difference. Um, I, I actually started to wire one of these once uh, after I put the track down, it became a nightmare for me. So I just tore the, tore the wires out and said to heck with it. But um, on this particular one, I used, if you remove this, you can see this even has some depth to it too. I don't even know, I don't know where this came from, but I, I bought it for five dollars at a train show and I thought it was a really good deal. So we go back to this. We have two 18-foot cars here and a Davenport. That's an Owen. This is Owen 30. Um this is these are flats. This is uh, made by Paper Creek. This one came from some company in uh, Virginia. I, I don't know if they're still in business or not. This is a wooden scenics little structure, and this one over here is a uh, plastic bill. I do. I I made the loading platform which is only about an inch wide. And so when you put a car up to it, it you get the illusion that it's a, a pretty wide uh, platform. Um, the roof there is just Paper Creek also. So this is what you can do in just a small area. Uh, it didn't take long to build. And I then created and put weathered wood front finish. And of course it's on a lazy Susan so it, so it turns. I can't turn it all the way now because the wall's in here. Normally in my train room, I, I would have plenty of room to do this. <clears throat> so as uh, these layouts become more and more popular, um, you can go online and see in the YouTube, you look up micro layouts and you can watch these all day that people have built. There's some very well-known um, People in California who have get-togethers. Dave Meek, I believe, is one of them. If you look it up, look up that site, uh, micro layouts, you'll see that that there are just lots of really, really nice ones. Uh, this is a good way also to introduce people to model railroading in a small area. It doesn't cost much for the equipment. You buy used equipment and put on here. Um, it's just a, another way to introduce people to model railroading who think they have to have a large empire to have fun. I know when I take these to shows, they don't realize how much you can really accomplish with one of these little micro or small layouts. A micro layout is usually less than two by four feet. After that, you become a full size layout. Those are, those are the only restrictions in the classification for that. Um, most of the cars that I run on mine also, on the other ones that I have, are the ones um, by Carroll Creek Design. That's uh, Bob uh, Gelmacher, who's on, on here. Uh, he, he 3D prints the cars, and they're very, very nice cars. Um, very reasonably priced, and uh, they fit on these small layouts with tight radiuses. We're usually running less than 10 inch radiuses on here. So we have to run small locomotives and cars. Um, so that's about, if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer as, uh, you know, as well as I can on them. That's about all I have tonight. Thank you, Dan. Great. I have a question. And I, I tell you, I think a lot 
I think a lot of modelers are really interested in doing what you, what you show tonight, Steve. So thank you. Okay. So what's I the question? have one question. Yeah. That one set of tracks that comes in, is is that a movable track from all, each one of those sections to your turntable? Yes. Table? yes. Oh, neat. Like there's, a, there's a stop that I can't, in other words, I can't push it forward to make uh -huh. it unline up and it can't pull it this way. You do okay. have to line up the middle one. And um, Bob Gelmacher made that little addition with a little handle. And so I put that on there. He does a lot of things for me. Um, and of course the turntable is made from a DVD. So the turntable, that's it. And it has magnets and screws so that it lines up and you just press it on. Neat. <laughs> And so you, you could actually, you can make this. Now, this is ON30 or HO scale. You could also put an N scale track on there and make an even longer one. It would be a little difficult to put O scale, but you could. You could put an O scale track if, uh, you know, you, you did it right. I've never seen it, but I'm sure you could do it. But this is all HO track that I bought used. The switches are used. Didn't cost much to build at all. I'd say everything there was probably less than $25 wow. to do that. So, you know. Very nice. So, Anybody have any more questions? What kind of tree you got right there? It's a what sage brand is that? It's a sagebrush. Seriously? Yeah, it's a sage, yeah. Yeah. And it's just Beautiful. got fire over it for, for, for the uh, branches. So let me understand, if you went outside and cut some sagebrush, brought it in and put it in No, 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 no. <laughs> That's what I was no. thinking. I've got friends that, that have been out west and brought back, you know, so I've got uh, barrels of this stuff. But that, that's real sagebrush, right? Yep. That yep. would be a good tutorial uh, in and of itself right there. I think it would, too, because I've never heard of that. Well, it used to be quite popular, and a lot of the ON3 people use them. Um, you have to really work with them and shape them. Um, they go out in the desert sometimes. There was a company that used to sell these, and they went to the desert. They gather them up. And then they would they would cut them and uh, you know they would actually create the armature. And then they were I mean they had some huge ones. They had some like fourteen inch, you know, eighteen inch trees. They were huge. Uh, I think that company is out of business now. But hey, Steve, um, hey, Steve, so where would where where would a modeler go to get sagebrush? You can go to Scenic Express. Well, also what I'm asking. Is is that a live tree that's on your layout that's been cut down, or did you add anything to that, or no. is it just as it is off the yes. off, off the tree? Yes, it just as it is. Wow. Mm. Yeah. But Cindy can express yeah. some bomb. Yeah, they sell uh, boxes of sagebrush, and uh, normally you can take the. Uh, the super tree material that comes with that and super glue it to the sagebrush armature and you get a pretty nice uh, tree. Hmm. And it comes yep. in all different scales. Frankly, that's a pretty nice looking tree right there. Yeah, Orange, what, he did, what he did seems to be a little bit cheaper though. <laughs> Orange yeah. Orange Boy Sedum is another one that you, that you can uh, use yeah, as an armature. Cut the buds off and everything. Yeah, I've got those people use, you know. Um, but what just the one tree is all I really wanted for this particular scene. 
you have a problem, you can't push it over too far because then you can't clear the cars. I actually had to put it back more. Yeah, I yeah. didn't want to take away from that. I just couldn't help but notice how amazing that tree looked. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, it, it's probably seven inches high, which is still pretty small in, in HO, I mean, in O scale. What about like in Florida, if you got a cypress twig, would that look something like sagebrush? Um, I do not know. I'll no, tell you what. Neither. I've heard a lot of modelers that use branches of certain trees, but then they have to flock them themselves. But you said you didn't add anything to this, and that's why I'm so intrigued. I added the, the fabric on here. I did not add the armature. There's nothing added. That's the way it comes. That's a branch. But all the all the greenery and the uh, it looks like like the microfiber material that right. supports the greenery that's all been added. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So I misunderstood. Okay. Either way, it looks amazing. Either way. Yeah. But I also added the little fencing. Steve, on the I'm all Go ahead. I'm sorry, Jim. Steve, I've heard. I've heard it's dangerous to take stuff out of your yard and bring it in and just put it on your model railroad. Do you treat this in some way for no. you know, kill bugs, insects, that kind of thing? I don't think I just bring it in and plop it down. You well, I I got it. I I'll got a done. bag from from somebody who who had stored it for years, and they gave it to me, and I just you know worked with it to put it on the layout. Jim, but that I, just that, that just adds yeah. extra animation. Yeah, well, hey, bugs, you know, they got yeah, bugs and things like that. <laughs> They're just uh, little birds. I think uh, didn't Howard uh, didn't Howard Zane uh, start doing the thing with um, kind of uh, treating them with glycerin or something like that to preserve them? I don't know. Yeah, some people. I think he did. I yeah, you 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 can do that with. Um, with like lichen or, or material like that. And I think it's like uh, one part glycerin to 10 parts water. And you can yeah, actually dye exactly it. Yeah, right. It was lichen that he was doing. Yeah, yeah you can, you're right. You yeah. can dye it at the same time. And I've had some uh, lichen like that, that really you could crumble it in your hands. That's how brittle it was. And once you soak it in that material, um, mm -hmm. it stays pliable for almost forever, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Now, that this tree, yeah. this I've had it for over 25 years. Jeez. It was actually on another part of my railroad. I took it off. And you didn't treat it with anything to preserve it? Nothing. Nothing. Well, you know, I go, out to, I go out to Bina, which is east of here, about 15 miles. It's an old uh, flag stop on the SP. And there's all kinds of sagebrush out there. And I just get the dead stuff. I don't get any green wood. And I don't have to do anything to it except add some greenery and plop it down. Yeah. That's it. Hmm. That's it. Makes a nice tree, doesn't it? Truly. <laughs> Boy, I can I say something else that's nice about sagebrush? I've used it in some dioramas. Uh, it also makes good dead trees. This is a diorama I made, and I just used a little piece of sagebrush over here on the right for a dead tree and I didn't have to do anything to it except stick it in the foam. Yeah, I think Jeez. Boomer Diorama from uh, Canada did the same thing, I believe, and his looks amazing. I'll tell you, if you want to make big big tree stumps, you know, with uh, root looking out offsprings, get a pumpkin, a pumpkin stem. Yeah, right. A pumpkin stem is a magnificent stump. Is that so going right to translate into uh, in scale? <laughs> well, you have, in you the have land to, of the giants. To, yeah. You have to get a gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> a small pumpkin. Very well, small. And armatures is if you grow tomatoes, have a patch of tomatoes. Yeah. After you've harvested, you pull the plant out, look at the roots, the root structure. And cut that off and dry it. 
Hmm. Okay, so what's the process of drying it correctly so that you don't have the issue with uh, bugs and mold and all that? Well, with, when I pick my own lichen, and then if you're worried about bugs, put it in a plastic oh. bag, spray in some bug spray and seal it up and just leave it like that for a week or, and then bring it back out, air it and let it dry. Call Orkin. Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm just that saying, like, money. if I were to take anything that I found in the natural world and translated it into my layout, is there a kind of a proper process that you do to ensure that it doesn't cause issues in the future? Let's say five months down the road to 10 years down the road. Is there a process? Well, I've I think heard if people are putting uh, dirt from their yard on their layout, they'll sometimes put it in an oven at about 250 to 300 for 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. there's a lot more organic living material in dirt than there is in oh, a, a dead tree or, or a shrub that's been dead for a year or more. It, it really doesn't have much on it except what it might have picked up from your skin carrying it in. Yeah, we, we don't have to do that in West Virginia because even the bugs moved away from us. <laughs> so basically the same process that I use to make my own ground flock out of sawdust, just bake it. Yeah. I've, I've never done that, but I've heard of people that have done it. Put it in the or, oven. Or up. a portable nuclear generator. You can just irradiate anything. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that, but I behaved myself. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i know all the home depot people by name now because i go and i gather all their leftover sawdust um and then i make my own ground material out of that uh but i have to bake it first but i i really thought that had something to do with you know the uh, you know letting the glue adhere to it the paint adhere to it properly I'm, i i really didn't think about it being um kind of neutralizing anything that would be harmful yeah. um, to your layout. But I guess if, if it's the same process, then that works. Just bake it. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Well, Steve, you, you've come up with a great uh, thing to talk about tonight. Thank you so very much. And, and I love the layout that you built for 20 bucks. <laughs> All right. Talk to you later. Yes, sir. Well, that's our show this evening. Uh, so, Pat, if we could run the caboose. Great caboose, Pat. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for our tonight, for our show. I hope you enjoyed it. Most importantly, I hope you learned something. I know I did. Thank you so much again for joining us this evening. Until next Wednesday, happy 